Welcome back. Now, the recently updated broad-based black economic empowerment codes have come under much scrutiny in the last few weeks. Business and government appear to be at loggerheads in terms of expectations, and this is creating a lot of uncertainty. As we attempt to unpuzzle the riddle, we're joined by Seth Randall, executive at Empowered, and Eric Ackroyd, very Verification Director at Empower Logic. Clearly, very empowered guys at the <laughs> desk this morning. Thank you so much for making the time to join us. Uh, perhaps uh, let me come to you first, Seth. What's the most significant change uh, in these new codes that is worth noting? Um, I think the, the largest thing is that there have been some whole scale changes to the targets, as well as the creation of three um, priority elements. Um, failure to meet any of the sub-minimums for the three priority elements will result in a company having their scorecard downgraded a level. Um, and so I think that really um, strikes at the core of, of what will become a lot harder for companies. Can we speak English? What sure. Are <laughs> <laughs> what are those elements? Okay. Mm. So um, essentially a, a scorecard on the broad-based black economic um, scorecard previously was measured on seven elements. Right. Um, being ownership, management, employment, equity, skills development, procurement, enterprise development, and socioeconomic development. Now it's gone down to five. It's gone down to five now, um, and three of them, the most important three essentially, have sub-minimum requirements, and those are ownership, mm -hmm. um, skills development, and what's now called enterprise and supplier development, so which is a combination of... What was the sentiment? What was the push behind changing, uh, changing the way things were? Essentially, when, when we went for the BEE Summit, which was the DTI, um, it was the keynote address was given by Jacob Zuma, um, and the DTI basically unveiled the codes. Their sentiment was that there were certain things in the previous dispensation that weren't working as well as they wanted mm, to. Right. So they felt that too many companies weren't taking some of the elements seriously, such as mm. ownership, um, and that it was too easy for some companies to score rather high ratings mm. um, on their scorecard without having any really substanti substantive mm. um, transformation taking So they weren't reflective really of what was going on. Exactly. Mm. I, mean, I, I couldn't help uh, but notice in your first uh, comment that uh, the one that wasn't in English that uh, Tandy was <laughs> picking up on is that you went into failure to meet these and it seems as if uh, there's been a lot of n uh, negative reaction almost to say that uh, it, it seems as if the penalty side of the, of the, uh, of the cause is far more amplified than the benefits to it. And so maybe let me come uh, to, to yourself and ask, what, where's the good in this particular story? Where are companies essentially able now to uh, really make strides in terms of their, their advancement mm. of the empowerment agenda with the new codes? Mm. I think the, the positive areas are that there's a, a lot more focus on skills development, right. thereby skilling black people, both employees and also people that weren't employed previously by the entity that we're looking at. And then furthermore, there's a lot of emphasis on enterprise development, mm. um, tightening up on the requirements for enterprise development, some qualitative aspects around that. And then also, um, okay, less emphasis around the employment equity aspects, but rather the bigger focus on, on skilling up employees and developing the competencies of employees. I mean, enterprise development has become quite a buzzword. So how easy is it for SMMEs to become compliant? Is it becoming easier? It's actually becoming <coughs> more difficult. The b s companies between 10 and 50 million turnover now need to be measured on all the five elements, where previously they were only measured on four elements that each counted 25 points, and it was a lot easier to achieve a good scorecard. So it's, it's definitely become a lot more difficult for smaller enterprises. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the black owned enterprises, right. there is a, a dispensation whereby a company that is, um, has a black ownership of 100% and they've got a turnover of between 10 and 50 million, that they by default are level one, which is the top scoring level. Uh, they do however still need to um, comply with an, an um, definition called empowering supplier, mm. which is very much focused on localization. Right. Which, on the one hand, it's it's an upside, so it's a lot easier for a black-owned company to to get a level one. But they do, however, need to look at the empowering supplier aspect mm. as well. Mm. I mean, let me come back to you, Seth. One sure. of, I mean, I happened to be at that summit, and the and the president and the minister spoke a lot about uh, cleaning up up on the fronting game. How does how do the revised codes actually address? In BE. I think um, the, the most um, direct 
address of, of fronting is within the revised BE Act, which is actually slightly separate to the codes of good practice, right. um, which are ancillary to that act. Um, and basically the fronting has been criminalized um, explicitly within the act with very severe penalties of up to 10 years imprisonment, um, up to 10% of a, a company's turnover being forfeited and up to 10 years um, prohibition of trade with the state. But is legislation then following uh, these uh, uh, proposed uh, amendments? Because I would think without the muscle to actually enforce any of that penalization, there's no point in, in, in making those statements. You know, we haven't seen a huge um, change in terms of the implementation of um, of the act. We still um, struggle sometimes to mm. get clarification on issues that are nebulous mm. within um, the legislation. So we haven't seen a significant change there. Um, the feeling generally is that if the market is taking these issues more seriously and that if companies like um, our respective companies are held responsible for not blowing whistles, um, you know, whistle blowing mm. on um, fronting exercises that people will start to be a little bit more interrogative right. when they are engaging with a company that may be fronting. So we hope that that, mm. that will improve. I think from my perspective, the issue of PE in South Africa is, is, a, is an elephant in a room in itself. And within there are various elements in the room. And one of those is the issue of monitoring. Mm. Now, there are so many uh, guidelines that have been issued over the years and only to be simply changed 10 years down the line because they weren't working. Mm -hmm. But actually, we don't know if they weren't working because there was no monitoring mm -hmm. to see actually mm -hmm. what it is mm -hmm. that's going wrong. Absolutely. Yeah. Do, I think do, we have mm -hmm. the, you know, do we have the means yeah. to change things? I think a, a big aspect about the codes is that there's a target as to what you need to put in or what you need to do, but there's right. no target as to how to measure the output right. or the quality of, of the mm -hmm. effect and the Im impact of these initiatives. Eric, I think just to latch onto your point, what worries me is that uh, prior to the amendment, there's a very clear uh, clause that would say after five years, the minister would review uh, in terms of efficacy, mm. and that's now come out. Is this creating uncertainty uh, 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 within mm. the business environment that there isn't a very clear time frame for mm. review? Yeah, I think there's this, your question being that of when do we look at it and change it and fine tune mm. it. So we, we now know that it has been it's not in effect yet, but it has been rearranged and there are new rules. Mm. There is a transition period of one year, mm. which means we will start, it will come into operation on the 11th of October of 2014. Right. Um, the, the, how we apply that effective date is unclear within the industry, and that industry meaning both business and verification professionals. So there is a lot of uncertainty not only as to when do we need to start measuring on this basis and when do we need to start implementing initiatives on this basis, but also the realignment of the existing um, targets and where we're shooting at in order to, to reach the expectations to the new expectations and the new targets and the new measurement methods. But it also must be incredibly difficult for businesses to keep up to date and to know what's really going mm. on. I mean, journalists, we, we struggle mm. to, to stay mm. abreast of the changes. So how do you keep your finger on the pulse? We read a lot. <laughs> um, you go to all the summits? Look, I'm, I'm glad because it gives us a job. <laughs> and it certainly is very technical. Right. And I think the bigger challenge is that there are different interpretations. And the codes, the revised codes, have certain grey areas and conflicting um, definitions in different places. Now all of us need to go and apply this in practice, mm -hmm. both companies and verification agencies and measurement companies. And with us looking from different angles, if we implement different um, interpretations, we, we're, not, uh, we're going to make it very difficult for business to implement this and to achieve mm -hmm. the objectives that they design to achieve. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to jump in there that we <coughs> encourage companies to be proactive about the process. So if a company employs, um, in our case we advocate technology and as enabler, if a company is able to employ something like a, a system, an online system where they're able to gauge their compliance on an ongoing basis, mm -hmm. then the technicalities of the codes can be built into those mm -hmm. processes so that the end users don't mm -hmm. have to be experts on the codes yeah, themselves. Yeah, I mean, particularly for SMMEs, they don't really have spare resources. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what it, you mentioned technology, is that the best way to stay abreast and to stay compliant? I mean, you've, you've got a number of options, um, being consulting where you have a company come in and 
um, do calculations for you and report you back on those. Mm -hmm. um, our approach is a consultative approach, but using a system that is within the domain of, mm -hmm. um, of the user. So they would then control the system mm -hmm. and...